Welcome to Wrestling With History. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe as we continue to bring you the greatest stories in the history of wrestling. CM Punk and Hulk Hogan. Could there be any two individual stars in the wrestling business more diametrically opposed to one another? CM Punk, the scrappy, undersized overachiever who defied the odds to reach the top of the card in the industry's biggest promotion with slick in-ring work and even slicker work on the microphone. Using slicing, shoot-style promos to create a genuine cult of personality. And Hulk Hogan, the picture of perfection when it comes to Vince McMahon's vision of a pro wrestler, or sports entertainer. Built at six foot six inches tall with the chiseled muscles of a Greek god. He sold the sizzle and not so much the steak, delivering hyperbolic promos that immortalized him as a generation of children's come to life superhero. The list of differences between the two is practically too long to mention. Starting perhaps, most importantly, with the way Vince viewed them as stars. Hogan had been handpicked by Vince McMahon Jr. upon his purchase of WWF from his father and his father's partners to become the centerpiece of his promotion, the supreme babyface to build his company around. It happened right out of the gate, with Hogan coming back to WWF television at the end of 1983 and winning the WWF World Heavyweight Championship from the Iron Sheik just three weeks later in Madison Square Garden. The legend behind this match is that Vern Gagne, owner of the AWA where Hulk had left from to join the World Wrestling Federation, had offered the Iron Sheik a true shooter, having represented Iran in the Olympics in wrestling, $100,000 to break Hulk Hogan's leg in this match, preventing him from having a world title run. Iron Sheik fortunately, at least for Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan, did not take Vern Gagne up on the offer. Gorilla Monsoon proclaimed after Hulk Hogan dropped the leg on Sheik for the pinfall, Hulkamania has arrived. And he wasn't exaggerating. CM Punk, conversely, did not have the red carpet rolled out for him upon his arrival to the WWE. Punk had taken a much different path to the big time. He started wrestling in the Lunatic Wrestling Federation. The LWF was a passion project by teenagers Punk, his brother, and his best friends. They'd wrestle in their backyard and end up getting enough local popularity they'd even begin running their own shows in small venues, barns, and wherever they could get into. Punk wasn't your typical deathmatch indie wrestler. He worked as a technician and a microphone master, displaying impressive in-ring technique and the early signs of his elite level promo skills. He modeled himself after two icons of the industry, Rowdy Roddy Piper and Bret Hart. Two wrestlers who would, interestingly enough, have on and off camera feuds with the Hulkster themselves. Punk would gain attention not for his physique, but for his enigmatic charisma and work rate, leading to his stint in Ring of Honor where he would blend reality and storyline together, having it leaked to the fans that he had been offered a contract from WWE and that he intended to sign it. Ring of Honor fans would chant, please don't go, please don't go, as he wrestled his final match for the promotion. He then turned on them by cutting a promo, claiming he was the devil himself and signed the WWE contract on his ROH world title. But when Punk arrived at the WWE, he wouldn't be programmed into a feud with the world champion as Hulk had. He was sent to Ohio Valley Wrestling, the WWE developmental territory. Punk was insulted by this. He considered it a demotion and tried to get to the main roster on Raw or SmackDown as quickly as he could. The WWE had long been known as the Land of Giants, with massive wrestlers being featured on top of the card like superstar Billy Graham, Big John Studd, Andre the Giant, and of course, the immortal Hulk Hogan. Knowing this was Vince's preference, Punk would balloon up to 240 pounds while in OVW, a weight that did not fit his frame or work style. It was an attempt to fit into Vince's world, but it wouldn't last long. In OVW, CM Punk would meet his biggest advocate, Paul Heyman, who saw in Punk a shining star that he could have built around in not only Paul's days running ECW, but in marquee angles on the main stage of WWE if given the chance. Interestingly enough, 
CM Punk would have a chance to showcase his ability on a new version of ECW with Paul Heyman at the helm. Sort of. CM Punk would debut in ECW in 2006 and be featured on their new program on Sci-Fi. Paul Heyman had strong creative plans for him, but Vince held final say and would often change the direction Heyman had in mind for the new ECW entirely. On the other hand, Hulk Hogan's first run with the WWF World Heavyweight title would last 1,474 days, just over four consecutive years. He'd carry the gold through the first three WrestleManias and drop it on the main event on NBC in 1988, a spin-off of Saturday Night's main event. The program would feature the Earl and Dave Hebner twin referee switch that led to Hulk Hogan being screwed out of the title. The shocking finish would be a part of the largest ever television audience for wrestling, a record that still stands to this day, with 33 million viewers tuning in. CM Punk's first run with the title was markedly different, with Punk winning the Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 24 and proceeding to cash in his championship opportunity on June 30th, 2008 on Raw, snatching the World Heavyweight Championship from Edge. The moment may have been special to Punk, holding the belt that had been worn by Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, and Sting, but it wouldn't precipitate a nearly 1500 day run like Hogan's first conquest did. It would end just over two months later, not with Punk being defeated for the title, but with an angle that Punk had been attacked backstage, and a championship scramble match would take place that night amongst JBL, Batista, Kane, Rey Mysterio, and Chris Jericho to crown a new champion, with Jericho ultimately walking away with his gold. Triple H would comment on CM Punk's first reign. Sometimes the guy makes the belt, and sometimes the belt makes the guy. It seemed like the belt was trying to make the guy, and it just doesn't work that way. It was clear that based on the booking decision and the sentiments from management, that this would be an uphill climb to the top of the card. The rocket that had been strapped to guys like Hulk Hogan would never be given to him. He'd have to scratch and claw his way for every inch until he became undeniable. While we never received a proper CM Punk and Hulk Hogan feud, on WWE television in 2011, we would get the modern day equivalent of it, with CM Punk ramping up aggressions against Vince McMahon's new franchise player, the super-powered babyface world champion that all the young fans would adore, John Cena. The second coming of Hulk Hogan in Vince's mind and the new bell cow and cash cow of the 21st century. After years of frustration in the WWE system, Vince would tell CM Punk that he was being given an open forum on Monday Night Raw to air his grievances and tell the world how he really felt. It would happen on the June 27, 2011 episode with John Cena laying in agony after being driven through a table inside the ring. Punk would sit cross-legged on the ramp and deliver the infamous pipe bomb promo. John Cena, as you lay there hopefully as uncomfortable as you possibly can, I want you to listen to me. I want you to digest this. Because before I leave in three weeks with your WWE Championship, I have a lot of things I want to get off my chest. I don't hate you, John. I don't even dislike you. I like you a hell of a lot more than I like most of the people in the back. I hate this idea that you're the best. Because you're not. I'm the best. I'm the best in the world. There's one thing that you're better at than I am, and that's kissing Vince McMahon's ass. You're almost as good at kissing Vince's ass as Hulk Hogan was. Punk would use his platform that night to cut down Vince, Stephanie, Triple H, and the entire system of WWE before ultimately having his microphone cut, ending the segment. The battle lines had been drawn, and the Punk promo would go viral, and his breakthrough into megastardom had been achieved. His voice of the voiceless moniker rang true as he expressed not only his own frustrations, but the issues that had been plaguing wrestling fans tired with the repetitive booking and the sterilized corporate product being offered by WWE for years. In January of 2014, one night after the Royal Rumble, CM Punk would walk out of Monday Night Raw before the show went on the air, telling Vince McMahon he was going home. When Punk left the company in 2014, as compared to Hulk Hogan leaving the WWE in 1993 after dropping his title at the King of the Ring, 
we actually begin to see some similarities developing between the two. As unusual as that may sound, given that CM Punk more or less holds Hulk Hogan in contempt, as though he has no respect for Hulk, and while they have never worked a program together in the ring, they have had their share of comments made about one another in the media. Perhaps most notably in a 2015 hockey feud during the Stanley Cup Finals that year, CM Punk's beloved Chicago Blackhawks were taking on Hogan's newly adopted Tampa Bay Lightning, Tampa being just a half hour's drive from Clearwater Beach, Florida, home of the Hulkster and Hogan's Beach Shop. After the Lightning took a 2-1 series lead, Hulk tweeted, Like I said, the Blackhawks are in a whole lot of trouble. They should take their puck, punk, home, and CM can show them the way, brother. Punk would call out Hulk's fair-weather fandom and retort, You mispronounced the team captain's name and didn't know the coach's name. You're a hack. Shut the F up or I'll wreck you, Hulk Hogan. Punk's tweet must have served as the motivation the Blackhawks needed, as they would go on to win the next three games, capturing the Stanley Cup with a 4-2 series victory. Watching hockey wasn't the only way CM Punk would spend his time away from the wrestling ring. He'd sign with the UFC for a couple of underwhelming losses, but would make millions of dollars from those appearances. Hulk Hogan once claimed that he'd been asked to join the UFC when it was still just starting out, but he'd turned them down. This statement has been refuted by Campbell McLaren, one of the UFC's original partners. Hulk Hogan may not have had the MMA experience Punk did while away from the ring. He did, however, rack up a significant amount of acting credits to his name. Hulk dabbled in film work, including an appearance in Rocky III, a movie that Punk would claim he's never seen, and also the wrestling-themed No Holds Barred that was promoted alongside the movie The Match a pay-per-view that included the movie, followed by a steel cage match that featured Hulk Hogan and Brutus Beefcake taking on Randy Savage, an on-screen antagonist from the film Zeus, portrayed by actor Tommy Lister Jr. Hogan would also star in a few family comedies such as Suburban Commando, Mr. Nanny, and tried to break out into full-time acting with his action-adventure show Thunder in Paradise as leading man Randolph Hurricane Spencer he'd end up just making 22 episodes of that show. While Hogan's acting work has been largely panned, the performance is not holding up as well in current times. It still holds its share of nostalgia for young Hulkamaniacs who grew up on the content and idolized the man. In another ironic parallel with the Hulkster, Punk would spend a portion of his time outside the ring with a foray onto the silver screen and small screen as well. Punk would star in a well-received outing as Don Koch in the psychological horror film Girl on the Third Floor, so positively reviewed that rumors of Punk to Hollywood in the fashion of The Rock and John Cena began to gain traction. Punk would also have a small role in Rabid, another thriller film, and as Ricky Rabies, portraying a babyface wrestler who would come to the ring adorned in the furs of various vermin on the territory wrestling drama Heels. The unusual good guy character would use a drone covered in fur that would shoot blood into the eyes of his opponents. While the two men both seemed to enjoy their time on camera in these various roles, they'd both be brought back to the ring by a billionaire who wanted to feature them on Turner Network programming in a well-funded wrestling company to compete with Vince McMahon in WWE. The shockingly similar pass would happen nearly 30 years apart from one another. While Hulk Hogan had been filming Thunder in Paradise, the location for the filming was on the same lot as the WCW soundstage. Hogan would often be seen at the location. Hulk began talking with wrestlers he knew that were at the television tapings for WCW, and fans would continually ask if Hogan was going to join the promotion. Eric Bischoff, who joined WCW in 1991 as an announcer, would be promoted to executive producer, and then in 1994 to executive vice president overseeing all of the operations of WCW. WCW had been losing money and desperately needed something to turn the tide as it sought to create a stronger national footprint and level up to compete with the WWF. Bischoff felt there was no bigger splash that could be made than bringing in the most popular wrestler in the world, Hulk Hogan. Hogan was offered a very unique contract for the era, a part-time fully guaranteed deal that saw him paid a minimum of $600,000 for each pay-per-view appearance, four for the year, 
and for four weeks of TV tapings leading up to these matches. On the May 28, 1994 episode of WCW Saturday Night, Hogan would tear up his Thunder in Paradise contract and claimed he was ready to return to wrestling. And on the episode of Saturday Night two weeks later, Hogan would sign his contract at a ceremony held at Disney MGM Studios. With Hulk Hogan in tow, Bischoff would continue to expand his new vision for WCW, increasing production values, as well as increasing the number of pay-per-view events held per year. But perhaps nothing more important than his creation of WCW Monday Nitro in 1995. Nitro was a live weekly television program to be featured on Ted Turner's TNT Network featuring Hulk Hogan as its biggest star, alongside Ric Flair, Randy Savage, and a host of other high dollar talent investments made by the company. It would go head to head with Vince McMahon's Monday Night Raw. Fast forward to 2019, Tony Khan, son of billionaire Shad Khan and the owner of the NFL's Jacksonville Jaguars, the Premier League's Fulham FC, an ultra-successful auto parts manufacturer, Flex and Gate, would finance his son's new venture, All Elite Wrestling. The company would be centered around Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, stars from Ring of Honor and New Japan that hadn't worked inside the WWE system, and Cody Rhodes, son of the legendary Dusty Rhodes, who had walked away from the WWE disgruntled with his treatment, all acting as executive vice presidents. They'd launch AEW Dynamite in the fall of 2019 on TNT. After nearly two years of Dynamite, most of which occurred from Daly's Place, the small theater outside the Jacksonville Jaguars Stadium due to the health crisis of 2020 and beyond, Tony Khan sought to make a big splash for his wrestling company, bringing in a hot act that had walked away from the wrestling business, much like Eric Bischoff had with Hulk Hogan. CM Punk said that he wouldn't return to wrestling unless it was to do something he really wanted to do, and that it would also require a boatload of cash. He was made an offer of more creative freedom, as well as a guaranteed contract for millions of dollars annually after years of courting by Tony Khan. CM Punk would make his return to professional wrestling after a seven and a half year absence on August 20th, 2021 on the premiere episode of TNT's AEW Rampage. Hulk Hogan's presence on WCW would lead to a boost in viewership, pay-per-view buys, and most importantly for Eric Bischoff, increased publicity and a new level of respect from the executives at Turner. Hogan would win the WCW world title in his debut match, defeating Ric Flair for the gold that bashed the beach. CM Punk would do much of the same for AEW, boosting TV ratings during the segments he appeared on, increasing pay-per-view buys, and delivering the company the largest ever live gate at the time when he captured his first AEW world title at Double or Nothing in Las Vegas 2022, all during his inaugural year with the company. His signing, like Hulk Hogan's, didn't need to balance the books. While they both increased business, it's not as clear if they directly covered the cost of their acquisitions straight out of the gate, but that would change for both men soon enough. Hulk Hogan's presence led to the creation of Monday Nitro, which would generate tremendous revenue for the company, particularly when Hulk Hogan shed the red and yellow stylings of Hulkamania and broke bad, turning heel at the 1996 Bash at the Beach, becoming the mysterious third man to join Scott Hall and Kevin Nash to create the NWO. They'd become the hottest act in wrestling and reverse the fortunes of WCW, turning it into a money-making machine for a meteoric couple of years. Punk is said to be a favorite of a Warner Brothers Discovery executive, the new entertainment conglomerate to supplant the original Turner Broadcasting Company. So much so that CM Punk has led to the creation of AEW Saturday Collision. Its similarities to WCW Monday Nitro don't just end when it comes to Hogan and Punk. The logo itself takes its inspiration from Nitro. The new program could potentially bring in tens of millions of dollars to AEW all but assuring the financial benefit of signing CM Punk. Just as the signing of Hulk Hogan, and more importantly, Hollywood Hogan, would end up doing for WCW. However, the presence of both talents and their new companies weren't without their challenges and controversies. Hulk Hogan was notorious for using his creative control clause in his contract, using his unofficial catchphrase, that doesn't work for me, brother, to turn down angles and matches he didn't approve of. 
Hulk Hogan would even leave WCW in 2000 after the weird and still unclear worked shoot angle at Bash at the Beach when Jeff Jarrett would lay down in the ring to take the pin from Hogan. After winning the title, Hogan would cut a promo calling out Vince Russo saying, This kind of BS is why the business is in the shape it's in. Russo would then come out and fire Hogan on air in a promo. Hogan would then file a lawsuit against WCW for the storyline, because it broke the parameters of his contract and also for defamation. Eric Bischoff claims that Hogan had agreed to everything up until the Russo firing of Hogan on air. That had not been discussed, making the angle a legitimate shoot. As convoluted and confusing as all that is, it would be the last time Hogan would appear on WCW until its demise one year later and explains in part just why it did go out of business. Hogan had walked out that night with the WCW title, but would then be stripped of it. CM Punk would have his own experience not completely dissimilar to this. On September 5th, 2022, after defeating John Moxley in a 20-minute bout to recapture the AEW World Championship at All Out, CM Punk would appear in the post-show media scrum. He would call out Hangman Adam Page for going off script during a promo that occurred in their feud for the AEW title, refer to the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, the EVPs that Tony Khan had brought in to build the company around as being children, and that they couldn't manage a Target store. Details of what occurred in the locker room after this are not completely clear and subject to interpretation, as non-disclosure agreements were signed by all parties involved to circumvent lawsuits, legal issues, and prevent public knowledge of the events. The generally agreed upon sequence of events that would follow the controversial interview given by CM Punk are as follows. Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, having heard what occurred in the press conference, stormed to CM Punk's locker room, pounded on the door and when it wasn't answered, kicked the door in, either to physically or verbally confront CM Punk. Punk having had his locker room door kicked in, immediately began to fight the intruders alongside his on-screen and real-life ally, Ace Steel. Punches were thrown, and it is claimed that Ace Steel threw a steel chair across the room and struck Nick Jackson above the eye with it. Punk's dog Larry was also in the locker room. Kenny Omega went to take the dog away from the commotion, and Omega ended up being bitten by Ace Steel during the melee, somehow. Punk would then be stripped of his world title on the next episode of Dynamite by Tony Khan, and remain off television for nine months as rumors of his possible return swirled. AEW Collision was announced to debut on June 17, 2023, with Punk being featured on the show. The Young Bucks and Omega would be featured on Dynamite to avoid future conflict between the two parties in a first in wrestling history. The story of Hulk Hogan's in-ring career is all but finished, though he is still petitioning for a retirement match. CM Punk's in-ring career, however, is not. What does the future hold for Punk? And how will his legacy be remembered when the final chapter is written? Will he be looked back on like his childhood heroes are? Roddy Piper, Bret Hart, and Steve Austin, revered and admired? Or will he be compared, ever increasingly, to the likes of a man he despises, Hulk Hogan?